I'm Marian Hester and I'm the owner of Fresh Isle Fibers. This is my garden. Most of the plants in here are used for natural dyes, for dyeing yarns. This is a very special plant, it's woad. The seeds came from Scotland and it dyes blue. The leaves give a blue dye. And if you remember the movie Braveheart with Mel Gibson, he cracks open one of the stalks and paints his face with the blue dye out of it. And it's the blue dye that was done with, uh, that dyed the Scottish tartans blue. So it's sort of a royal bright blue. These go to seed and the seeds uh, are a black kind of color. And then I sell the seeds for other people who'd like to grow woad. These are going to be melons, citron, watermelon, cantaloupe, and then they'll spill over the beds. Every bed will have uh, marigolds in it and different herbs, and that is partly to keep away the wildlife and the deer, uh, just to stop them from, from coming in. Sometimes they'll take a little nibble, but then they don't come back. So these are just sprouting. These are carrots. For eating but the tops of the carrots I also use for dyeing they dye green all of the herbs dye um, greens and the marigolds do yellows and oranges these are blazing star they're an arctic plant and they'll get a very tall purple flower on top and you dye with the the top purple flower and it will give a pinky purple not a very strong pinky purple but uh, and they're a perennial, they'll come back every year. More marigolds, cucumbers, zucchini, squash. Again, for eating, but anything with a vine, um, the cucumbers, the tomatoes, all of the vines will dye a green. So once I'm done with the food part of it, <laughs> then I harvest the vines for dyeing. I have a little bit of coreopsis, uh, and it doesn't take much. And there's another one in a bed over here, but these ones are in bloom. Coreopsis give the most beautiful golden dye color. Just gorgeous dye color. And these are dahlias. And I'll just collect the spent blossoms all summer long. And I have another few over there. And then I, when I have enough, I will dye with the dahlias. And they will give oranges, peaches, really pretty colors. <laughs> this is false indigo, uh, which doesn't dye a real true blue. It's more like a really light blue, but it's a beautiful purple flower. And they get a gorgeous black seed pod on them in the fall that shakes uh, full of the seeds. And the bees and all of the wasps love them. Garlic chives for eating, peppers for eating, <laughs> rhubarb. Um, every couple of years I dig the rhubarb up and it's the root that gives an orange dye. And the leaves of a rhubarb contain a natural tannin. So you don't need to add a mordant to set the color in the dyes. So like a lot of people will add alum, which is a safe chemical, or copper, or iron, or some of the more harmful chemicals to actually set the dye in the wool. But if you add a rhubarb leaf, it adds the actual tannin mordant without changing the color. So you don't need to add a chemical to your dye, you just add a rhubarb leaf. A lot of these are purple beans. I have the regular yellow and green, but uh, purple beans will also dye a, a nice purple color. So do you use the pods and the beans yes, themselves? the beans themselves. Yeah, and the one thing I do is sometimes we eat them and then I'll save the water <laughs> till I have enough and, and die with that. Uh, beets at the very end, beets will not dye wool. You can get a, a dye on cotton or maybe even silk, but not for the wool. So they're just for eating. Um, a lot of what would dye the porcupine quills will actually dye wool. Oh, really? So some of those older books mm -hmm. uh, work for wool, cool. but a lot of it's trial and error. Yeah. Oh, Just have to get it. <laughs> and one year you'll get a beautiful color from something and the next year it won't happen at all. Oh. It just is on the, it's mm -hmm. the plant. 
Interesting. It's whatever is yeah. in the plant. Mm -hmm. um, these are sunflowers. All sunflower heads will give you a brownish color, uh, but these middle ones are a Hopi sunflower uh, from the southwest, and they have a huge head on them with purple seeds, and it will dye purple. All my edibles of lettuce, radish, oregano, tomatoes, farbid, again, the vines of zucchini, pumpkin, will dye the green. I have some interesting new plants here, <laughs> new strains this year. And I read that nasturtiums and onions are good companion plants. So I have my requisite four and new ones for me this year. <laughs> I've tried different varieties, but these ones are new. This is another one of my specialty plants from Scotland. Uh, originally got the seeds from Scotland as well. It's called Madder. And it feels very cactusy. It's very, very picky, which you can't see on film, but <laughs> it sticks. Um, it has a little white flower later on, but it's the roots that you dig up to die with. And they give a beautiful, glorious red color. The British red coats were dyed with Madder roots. And you can see the spots where I have dug up <laughs> and, and harvested some of the roots. Um, it is difficult. You have to dry the roots, you have to grind them, you have to soak them, strain them. It's, it's a fairly long, lengthy dye process, uh, but the colors you can get from a really bright red to a pink, peaches, just beautiful, beautiful colors. Oh. And this really stops the wildlife from getting in mm. because it's so picky. Mm. These three are hascaps and we have little berries coming already. This is, I don't know, there's a, I was looking for a good shot of them. And they'll get to be purple, kind of like the size of a grape. Um, and they're nice just to eat out of your hand or to make jelly with. And that is sweet grass. Here. And it, there's not much smell and it's ready to be harvested. Uh, but once it's dried, it's got that beautiful sweet grass smell. Uh, and then it'll come again in the fall. So, so some of this I don't die with, but it's we eat, we use. And I do some crafts with the sweet grass. The crates are kind of interesting because this is a favorite turtle habitat, this whole area and they like to lay their eggs kind of along the edge of the grass and the, and the gravel. So we were lucky enough this year to actually see them as they laid. And I caught two of them laying and those underneath those are where they laid their turtle eggs. So we've watched them hatch in the past. So hopefully this fall we'll be able to watch them again. So I'm protecting them from the predators. <laughs> <laughs> the water barrels at the end uh, I water with. And then, if you'll behind me to the side, you might have to go up. we have two totes that we fill with water, and then it's gravity fed down. Um, Todd fills the water from the lake and then pumps it into those spots, and then I water from there. The raised beds are made, made perfectly for my height, of course, and they're poured concrete. They were uh, made with forms, we had three forms did three at a time, and they're set of five, there's 15 raised beds. So there's rebar in them, so that as they heave in the winter, they don't split. And then the tops is just are just finished off with the composite decking material. When we filled them, we put in some gravel, just in the bottom a little bit, then about a eight to inches to a foot of soil, and then topsoil. Now, I've had to top them up with topsoil, um, every year, just, just a bit, just a bit. So we get bags or a load of topsoil because as they do settle. This is the Fresh Isle Fibers mobile shop. So welcome, come in. So we offer the hand dyed yarns uh, from the sheep of Manitoulin Island. So it's Manitoulin Island wool, all hand dyed, primarily with natural dyes. And then I offer 
kits and patterns for you to knit or crochet your own items. I also make herbal soaps and salves, again, primarily from the plants from the garden. So all of the scents and colors are done from natural products. So some of the yarns dyed from the plants you've seen previously. This is the woad. Again, that beautiful blue color from those yellow plants. Um, this is sumac, not in the garden, but grows in the wild from those red berries from the staghorn sumac. We'll give this kind of a rosy brown. With this, it's just the sumac, and then do you mix anything else with it? Rhubarb leaf. Sumac and a rhubarb leaf. Now, sumac, you don't really have to because it has a tannin in it as well, but I just throw it in. It's habit. I add it to everything. <laughs> this is uh, one of the softer matters, that prickly plant, and this is a, a light, gentle peach. All of my reds from it have sold, of course, but I'll have more. I'll have more. And this is from the marigolds that would give a yellow and then dipped in indigo. So it gives a sort of a green color. So some examples from plants from my garden, all naturally dyed. Now our wool is all from Suffolk sheep. So it doesn't felt in the washer and dryer. So you can put the finished items. So even this won't felt, mm -hmm. but it will work for needle felting. Okay. This one is beets with some iron. So even though beets won't stick well to wool, if you add some of those specific mordants like iron, mm -hmm. it will. This is all storage underneath. So it was built for traveling. Mm -hmm. So nothing shifts around. And there's a little slot here in the bottom and another one here at the top. And then we have sheets of thin plywood that slide in there for when we're traveling so that nothing spills out. And then these can slide out as well so you can rearrange your shelving as you need to. I've been doing this since 2001. My uncle had sheep and my grandfather before him. And in the past, they would when they the shearing was done, they would sell their wool to the Canadian Wool Cooperative in Ottawa. In 2001, they were being charged to actually ship their wool and they were not receiving enough for their wool to make it worth their while. And I had been knitting forever and was just learning how to spin. And I had all of this fleece that was free <laughs> from my family. And so that summer we visited uh, a number of mills, my husband and I, and we chose a couple of mills that did not use any chemicals to process the wool. And we sent all of my uncle's fleece away to be processed. And it came back that fall and we had hundreds of pounds of yarn. <laughs> and so I started dyeing it. It was all white and I wanted colors and natural plants were free. And so I, that's how it started. And I started selling on eBay by February of 2002, it was all gone. We were waiting for them to shear again. And so that year we bought from other farmers on the island as well. And so now my, my uncle has passed away, but we continue to buy fleece in the spring from other farmers and I continue to dye it. Dyeing the wool uh, was a hobby and I love the, the dyeing, I love the knitting part. Uh, I was t a school teacher and I was selling online and I loved the computer parts of things. Uh, when I retired from teaching, I wanted to take my yarns to local markets. I wanted to be part of the farmer's market scene. Um, and so we did that for four or five years, something like that. So the advice that I would give for someone who wanted to start trying out natural dyeing um, is to start with what's local. There are many local wild plants, uh, particularly here on Manitoulin Island or Northern Ontario, even Ontario. Things like Queen Anne's lace, um, many of the nuts, the acorns, the black walnuts, all of those are easily and pretty much readily available. 
And so start with those. Start simple, start small. Um, we do a lot of our dyeing outside uh, with uh, one of those chicken deep fryers and that's easy and it's outside. Um, and that's how I start. I still do fairly small batches, but you know, one skein is plenty just to start trying with the local plants. I enjoy working with natural dyes instead of instead of the commercial dyes um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is the excitement of, of what color am I going to get because you never really know and it does change from year to year. Now you can have disasters where where you spend all this time and don't get any real good color but you sometimes you get some beautiful surprises and so that's always quite exciting to see what am I going to get. Um, I love the colors of natural dyes. I love the soft muted tones and I think no matter what you use for a natural dye those color combinations go together. So if you're looking at knitting with different colors like Fair Isle or something those you're, you're guaranteed no matter what natural dye you use that they will go together. And then the third reason for primarily again for me they're free it's just time I'm out walking in the bush in nature and it's so it's nothing to to pick a few little wild violets as I'm going and you have to be careful where you are and how much you harvest and do it sustainably but a lot of that is free <laughs> so people can find me online on my website freshislefibers.com and it's fibers E-R-S because mostly I sell online and most of my customers are from the United States. So freshallfibers.com or you can visit me here. I'm just in Gordon Township just outside of Gore Bay on Manitoulin Island. Hey everybody, I'm Forrest the Filmmaker, the person behind the video that you just watched. If you enjoyed that and want to check out more Alternative Dwellings, we have a playlist popping up that is all the episodes that we've ever done. There's van tours, tiny home tours, sailboats, off-grid, uh, garden tours, all sorts of cool stuff, so check that out. We also uh, release new episodes every single Monday at 8.30 Eastern Time, and that's in the morning. And if you want to check out some curated things that I've done and some movies that I've actually made, you can check out a link below to Prime Video and you can check out the reality of hashtag van life, best friends, moments, and curated alternative dwellings. So check that out. Thanks for watching. Hit subscribe. We'll see you on the next episode.